E. So there's five genera there, Circium, there are six native species, two non-native, then Carduus, those are the plumeless thistles, Carduus nutans and Carduus acanthoides. There's a whole bunch of Centaurias. Uh, we'll talk about some of them. They'll, I'll have all of them in the, in the table that we'll look at, but uh, I only worked on keying out the four most common ones. And uh, I'll explain why as we go look at that table. On a portum, uh, the cotton or scotch thistle, and then burdock is in this tribe. It's in this tribe according to Flora of North America, but I noticed that in the angiosperm working site, the angiosperm phylogeny working site, that I think it's been moved into its own tribe there. Nonetheless, we'll go ahead and include it. You can see over there on the right, the tribe worldwide has 83 genera, so it's a pretty, pretty sizable tribe with 2,500 species. 17 different genera in North America and 116 species in North America. And then there's Iowa's data, five and 24. So if you look at what kind of characterizes the tribe, card UE, they can be any of those possibilities there of annuals, biennials or perennials. There's probably mostly biennials and perennials. Um, certainly it, there's not many um, annuals, at least not that we have. Leaves are always going to be simple. They're always going to be alternate. There's always usually basal rosettes. And so at least with those biennial species, the first year they'll grow as a basal rosette. And this is what we mean by that. There's just a, a big cluster of, of leaves that are attached to a caudex. Uh, the term caudex means a short compressed stem, basically. That's right at the ground level. Uh, and a, a biennial generally grows just this cluster or basal rosette of leaves for the first year, uh, photos, photosynthesizing and, and putting energy down into a taproot. And then, of course, the second year is the year that it blooms. The leaf margins are often spiny, as it says here. And here's a picture of some of those spines. Let me get my pointer, I guess, here. Um, there's one right there, there's one. The sharp pointy things on the leaves here are actually spines. They're not prickles. There's a difference between spines and prickles. Prickles are modified hairs. They're made to be sharp and pointy, po po pointy. and spines are modified leaves. And what happens on most of the thistles is the mid vein of the leaves extends out as a sharp spine or as a, again a sharp pointed structure and since it's coming from a leaf it's origin from a leaf that makes it a, a spine a lot of the the stems could also be uh, pointed and sharpy things on them as well but since they're stems those are hairs so on the stems those would be called prickles the heads are discoid which again is a term that means in the astro ace uh, it's one of the uh, three main options that basically Asteraceae have. Uh, that means that there's only disc flowers. So what that means is you have a receptacle like this right down here, kind of a nice little diagram. And then there's flowers, a bunch of flowers attached to that receptacle. And in the, the uh, discoid heads, they're all disc flowers, which means they all look like this flower right here. They have uh, an inferior ovary. They have a modified calyx. That's this pappus, which we'll talk more about. They have a corolla with five lobes. The stamens are attached to the inside of the corolla tube. And then there's a style that comes up from the ovary down here and it, and it grows up through the, the, the tube that the anthers form. The anthers are fused together and that makes a, a little cylindrical tube the style grows up between those and, and produces two style branches since there's two carpels that have fused together to, to form it. So again, this simply means that um, all of the flowers are gonna be disc flowers. There are no ray flowers. So again, that's why thistles do, do not look like sunflowers. Sunflowers have both disc flowers and ray flowers, but for cardio, you don't. Lots of different possibilities for color here. 
red, purplish, pink, blue, white. The disc corolla tubes are uh, kind of unusually long as far as, you know, Astro ACE go. And I put this picture in down here. This is a picture of one of the Centauri's. And you can see, um, again, these are the corollas for those disc flowers. Um, they, they are really elongate. The, the corolla lobes can be fairly long, quite a bit longer than what you see right here. This is just a di uh, basically a di diagrammatic version just to show what a ray flower and a, a discoid head looks like. But the, uh, the lobes here are, are fairly long, again, kind of longer than what you usually see. The involucre bracts, or they're called the filaries, another term for them. That's all of these things, all of these greenish, uh, small scale-like structures that form the, what's called the involucre. It sits uh, around the base of the head. Remember what we're looking at here is a head inflorescence. There's lots of flowers, lots and lots of disc flowers where there's probably only about maybe 20 right there. But in general, there can be lots of disc flowers that are attached to the receptacle like we see here. And uh, subtending those like right here, these are involucral bracts right here as well. There's only one series of them here. In uh, Cardio E, there's going to be lots of involucral bracts, many series of them. And quite often, in most cases, uh, not quite true in all genera, but again, in general, most of those, most of the species are going to have these involucral bracts that have tips that have a spine. So the tip of the involucral bract, like what would be right here, is, is a tip. Uh, we're seeing really short bracts right here. Then we're seeing all these spine things here. Those are the spines that are coming off the, the tip. Spines or, or bristles, uh, the difference there is how rigid the, the, the structure is. So the receptacles are the place where all of these disc flowers are attached. So that's what this is down here. The disc flowers are attached to the receptacle. If there were ray flowers, again, like in sunflowers, they would be attached to the perimeter of the re receptacle. What this is saying is that the receptacles are flat. Uh, maybe they have a little bit of a, a conical shape, um, meaning that the center of the re receptacle kind of rises up a little bit, uh, but they're not, you know, it's, it's fairly short, as it says. And uh, what they have also, besides the disc flowers, which are these things right here, uh, they have a lot of these little bristles. That's, that's what's shown right here. In some of the Asteraceae, like in the sunflowers, instead of having bristles attached around the disc florets, they have little scale-like structures. So that's what's shown over here. But in the, again, in the cardioe, um, this is the situation. If you were to pull the disc flowers apart, uh, I wasn't able to find a picture uh, where that was done. So I unfortunately I couldn't, I can't really show you the real thing, but if you were to pull the disc flowers apart, kind of just pull this whole disc, discoid head apart so you could see the receptacle, then you would be able to see those. They're going to be all uh, in and around the disc flowers. Uh, anther bases have tail-like lobes. Well, a lot of the, uh, the anthers in Asteraceae have these uh, little appendages right here, these little pointed structures at the top, but not all of the Asteraceae have these little tails. And so these tails are a pretty good characteristic again for this tribe. Uh, these little dark colored uh, structures that are pointing downward. The anthers are right in here. Again, there's, there's three of them shown here. Uh, there'd be two more on the other side. And remember, these anthers are fused together to form a, a short little tube. The filaments are down here. These are the filaments that attach the, anth that attach the stamens to the inside of the corolla tube. So these little tails are there. And then um, a pappus. So the pappus is uh, a modification of the calyx. So the Asteraceae don't have uh, none of the disc flowers or ray flowers have what would be called a, you know, a typical calyx or sepals. Those sepals have been modified in some way, shape, or form 
to make this structure called a pappus. And the pappus in the um, card UAE are bristles. They can be either plumose bristles or barbellate bristles. We'll see some pictures of those in just a little bit. So we're going to start here with um, the key to the tribe. This will key out to five genera that we have in I Iowa. The first part of the key here is 1A. The couplet that goes with that or the statement that goes with it is the 1B way down here. And what this is saying here, you, you look at the 1A and then you look at 1B, they should be, you know, in a key, those are going to be contrasting statements. Those statements are going to be uh, saying two things and the two things should be as opposite as possible. So up here it says stems are winged, the wings are spiny along the margin. So in this picture right here, we can see a stem and the wing tissue is just uh, real thin, you know, uh, linear tissue that comes off of the stem. It runs vertically up and down the stem. That's what we're seeing right in through here, uh, a wing tissue that's along the nodes, excuse me, along the internodes here. And you can indeed see uh, some uh, spines along them as well, or prickles. They should be prickles there, I guess, because it's coming off of the stem. This one down here says stems not winged, or if winged, if, they, if there are some wings, then the wings do not have any kind of spiny or prickly structures on them. And that's represented by this picture here. So we're contrasting those two stems in 1A and 1B. Pretty easy to make a choice there. So let's go with 1A and work through these first. If the stems are winged, then it could be a cerceum, or it could be a carduus, or it could be an onoportum. Those are the three genera they're going to key out under 1A. So the next statement then would be, again, what's that pappus look like? Uh, is the pappus, are the pappus bristles plumose? That's what uh, plumose bristles look like. So again, here's what a pappus is. Again, here is the fruit. The fruit has formed from the ovary, which again, remember in the Asteraceae is an ovary that's inferior. So the ovary sits below the attachment of the petals and sepals. Well, again, the sepals aren't here in their usual form. The sepals here are highly modified and multiplied into these bristles, but these bristles are feather-like. That's what plumose means. The other option here is pappus bristles, not, plum not plumose, though sometimes they can have short ascending barbs. So what we're looking at here is, this is a nice diagram. Uh, these are pappus bristles. This one right here is plumose. And that's what we're, we were seeing again right here. This one right here is not plumose, but it has little short barbs that are uh, pointing upwards there. Uh, this one has some barbs too. Uh, this one is smooth. So if the pappus bristles are plumose, that's gonna be cerceum. All cerceums have a pappus that has the plumose pap pappus. Now, cerceum keys out here. It's also going to occur out, uh, should be key out at another point because it's possible that uh, there are cerceums that are like this down here. There are cerceums that do not have uh, wings. This is a cerceum right here, in fact. So, cerceums key out both here and here. This one that keys out up here is going to key out to bolt uh, thistle. That's what this is right here. All right, so, but that's at this point, we're just keying to the genus. So this gets us to a cerceum. If we had um, bristles that look like these over here, these three, then we would be taking 2B and we would then go now with these two couplets. Um, kind of long here, but um, receptacle with dense bristles. Again, that's what we're talking about. Again, back here, uh, receptacle with these bristles like that. So you're gonna have to kind of dig into the um, into the head in order to see those. So dense bristles. They're also called uh, set of form scales, which again basically means a hair-like scale. The receptacle is not fleshy. The fruits are not embedded into the surface or sunken down into the receptacle. 
That's the opposite of here, saying that the receptacle uh, has, first of all, has scales. Going to look more like this, scales. And the fruits are embedded somewhat into the surface of that receptacle. They appear somewhat sunken down into it, into little, little pits. Again, I could not find a picture of that. Um, someday maybe I'll be able to take a picture of my own, but uh, I couldn't find one. Up here it says the leaves can be glabrous or sparsely prickly, uh, pubescent on the dorsal surface, that's the top, often densely woolly or felt hairy on the ventral surface. So there's a fair amount of variation there, but um, at least on the dorsal surface, they're either glabrous or just sort of sparsely pubescent. Down here, these are densely woolly, hairy on both sides. Pappus bristles here are distinct. Sometimes they can be a little bit fused together. That's what this means. Conic means fused uh, towards their bases. Uh, down here, it says the Pappus bristles are always fused. So you can see again, this is going to lead to carduous. This is going to lead to autoportum. Um, that's what this species is right here. And that's what this, the carduous is what this one is right here. I'm looking at the leaves again. So again, this is the difference in the um, surface of the leaves, the top surface of the leaves. That's the best and easiest, most uh, uh, observable characteristic that's in here. You know, keys are written to usually if the key is written well, there's, there's at least three or four characteristics at least that you can look at in each of these. Uh, and sometimes, again, some of them don't work very well or you can't see them if you don't have flowers and you're not going to see, um, see a re receptacle. So, uh, and again, just to show you a picture, uh, I use the leaves. This one's glabrous on the surface here. This one down here is definitely, um, the whiteness here is caused by the sort of a dense woolly hairiness. So if you see really a, a white, surface on a leaf and you look at it real close of course with the hand lens or you often just see the hairs with your eyes uh, you'll see that that whiteness is again being caused by really dense short little hairs okay so we've got cerium carduus and onoportum keyed out now uh, oh here's a here's an example of um, pappus bristles not plumose these right here um, which again is going to be true for car carduous because carduous comes out underneath 2B right here. And that's what we can see here. These are just bristles. They don't have a feather uh, like structure. Just a single uh, hair. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and key out the two carduous that uh, are in Iowa. And that's done by looking at those uh, involucral bracts the filaries, and it says that the filaries uh, in 1A, the filaries here are three to five millimeters wide. Well, that's these are the filaries right here. And that's definitely what those look like right there. If you contrast it with the other one, the filaries are less than two millimeters wide. That's gonna lead to acanthoides. And that's what this one is right here. And again, we can see these filaries here uh, maybe these are a little bit easier to see right here. Those filaries or those in, in velucro bracts are definitely not nearly as wide as what these are. So the smaller ones are acanthoides, the larger bracts are new, nutans. You can also use the uh, size, the diameter of the inflorescences here, the, the flowering heads. Uh, nutans has uh, it's larger, four to nine centimeters, as it says, whereas the acanthoides, plumus thistle are going to be shorter or not as wide. A good one is, again, the name Nutans comes about because that means a, a nodding uh, flower, basically. And so these heads here, as they mature, they begin to nod. You can see some of these, um, we'll see even some of the purple ones are turned over, pointing downward. Uh, some of these brown, uh, browner ones are, are pointing downwards or towards the side. So you can use that too. And it's always true that the heads in Nutans are solitary at the ends of branches. So you see, always see just a single flower head at the end of the branches at the top of the plant. 
Uh, these over here can be a little bit more clustered. All right, so that again separates the two carduous. Must thistle is a lot more common uh, than plumus thistle. Then the, the only onoportum that we have when you key out uh, a plant with this key, you come to onoportum. Uh, there's only one species in Iowa, and that's onoportum acanthium. And so here's a picture of some pictures of what it looks like. I've not even seen this um, species. It's not very common at all, of course, but um, we'll look at the table in just a little bit. One thing about it is it's, it's again got that really woolly look to it. And we can see that here in this plant, uh, even on the, you know, again, on the leaves, on the stem, all throughout the plant with those dense uh, mat of short little white hairs. And also the involucre, as you can see right here, um, like many thistles, again, the involucral bracts are pointy and sharp, but intermixed amongst all of these involucral bracts is uh, a lot, uh, is a pubescence that's called cobwebby. And it looks like spider webs. And that's why cobwebby is a term that's used. It's just a really thin, a uh, lot of thin interconnected kind of hairs. You can see that kind of all among the, um, the bracts here. All right, so we've got, um, Parduous and on a portum taken care of. Now, again, if we go back to this one right here, we would, so what we did is we, we worked through the stuff that came out under 1A. Now we're gonna work through stuff that comes out under 1B. So 1B again is repeated here. And again, that was, that said the stems are not winged or if they are winged, they're not spiny. So, now we're going to key under that, and the first couple here is going to pull off arctium, basically by using this couplet here that says the involucral bracts have these long, stiff bristles that are hooked at the end. And there's what these, those look like. This again is the involucral right here with all the bracts. They have these long, um, the, I, I would even, well, certainly stiff bristle probably works. I mean, they're not really stiff enough to be a spine, um, but they're, they're more stiff than a hair, so bristle is probably a good term. But you can see that they they are hooked at the at the tip. The other alternative is in bracts spiny with a flattened or fringed appendage or just unmodified, just just a just a spine. And here's a couple examples of other types of involucral bracts then that um, would be would be keyed out underneath 4B. This one here has just got some um, little fringed uh, cilia type little fringe bristles, you might say, uh, uh, at the uh, tips of the bracts. This one here has some just some short little spines. But again, ne ne neither of these, of course, look anything like that. Uh, the the, the um, involucral bracts on burdock are very distinctive. Of course, that's what hooks into your clothing and makes them um, you know, go along for a ride whenever you brush up against them. So we'll look at the arctiums in just a little bit, but that would pull them off. <clears throat> uh, if we go with 4B, then we're gonna go to five now. And here we see we're gonna separate centurias from the circiums. And the way that basically happens is by looking at the fruits, the fruits, again, the, the um, ripened and mature ovaries is what a fruit is. And in the Asteraceae, these are called Cipsella. They're a, a special type of akene. But so we're looking at these fruits and it says the fruits are asymmetrical at the base. They can kind of appear, appear to be obliquely or laterally attached to the receptacle at their base versus here's fruits symmetrical at the base appearing basally attached. So this one right here, Circium, is what this one is right here. Here's the base of the keen. It's just got this nice sort of symmetrical look to it. The keen is attached right at the base. In, in Centuria, what happens is you look at these bases here and there's definitely an asymmetrical aspect there. One side um, 
like this side here does not look the same as this side over here. And here you can actually even see a little bit of a pit. So that, that this is what causes it to be asymmetrical. And this is what it cause is causing it to, um, the result of this is because it is um, attached to the receptacle more obliquely or more at the side of the base, not attached at the very bottom. It's attached more from the side at, at the base. And this is kind of like a scar, basically, uh, when that uh, cipsella come, comes off. So looking at the fruits is the, the best way, um, if you have them, of course, to separate centurias from circiums. You can also use the pappus, though. As it says here, um, again, circiums are going to have, like, like I just said a little while ago, they're always going to have a plumose um, bristles in their pappus. Again, you can kind of see the plumose bristles here slightly. Those, the, the parts of the bristle that are forming the, the veins of that feather structure are pretty thin and they're kind of hard to see. But again, using a scope or a hand lens, you should be able to see them. And again, you can kind of see those right in there. Whereas in Centuria, the, the pappus is, um, doesn't, is not plumose, first of all. Uh, if it's just bristles, then it looks like this, uh, just bristles all by themselves without any feather uh, type of structure there, just the central part of what would be a feather type. Or they can have a double pappus and so have uh, an inner series that are short bristles and usually then an, another shorter, a very, a very, very short series of structures that are short little scales. You can see some bristles here and some short little scales right here. But it's pretty, pretty distinctive, I think, you know, in separating those, those two uh, types of fruits there. Shouldn't have any problem with that. That should be pretty uh, straightforward. Okay, so let's key out the Arcteums. There's three Arcteums that are in North America and the um, Maps and Bonap and Eilers and Rosa say that we have all three of them. So I'm, I put them all into a key here, but Flora of North America, the person who did uh, the card UE in Flora of North America and who wrote the key for all of these. Um, in the Arctium discussion, he points out that he looked at specimens, of course, from all over the place. He did not see any specimens of these two species from I I Iowa at least not from the herbarium at Iowa State. Okay, well, anyway, let's look at the key here. Uh, the one that we do have, uh, and is somewhat of an invasive species, it's becoming so, certainly, is Archaea minus, and that separates from the other two here uh, uh, with 1A and 1B on how the, the, uh, the discoid heads, again, we're, now we're talking about these heads right here, again, a group of flowers, how those heads are kind of arranged. In Arctium minus, the heads are sessile, which means that there's really not any kind of a, a um, stalk that is attaching them to a branch. They're, they're sitting kind of right at the, at, at the base. And that's what we're kind of seeing here, these heads right here. You don't really see any kind of stalk in there at all, nothing like a short peduncle or anything that is attaching them. There, there can be a short peduncle. That's why it says sessile to short peduncle um, these look like they're sessile right here. Uh, 1B says the heads usually in long pedunculate uh, corymbiform clusters. Well, that's what we're looking at down here. These long peduncles right here. So long structures here that are again are, are uh, arranging these heads into what we see here. So that's probably the best way to separate them. If, if we did, we even had these species in Iowa, which I, I don't think we do, but um, that would pull Arctium minus away from these two. And then these two are separated uh, pretty much on the base of the diameter of the involucre. Here we can see um, a larger involucre diameter here and a, a shorter, a smaller one here. This one is um, Lapa and this one is Tomentosum over here. Another good way to do it though is this, which is uh, also the second part in the key, the, the fillery. Uh, apices, the tips of the ap apices here are glabrous or have just a little bit of cobwebby appearance in them. 
uh, whereas tomentosum is definitely densely cobwebby. And again, we can see that cobwebbiness when we look at these heads. You can just kind of see a fine uh, mix of, of little thread-like structures going all through there. And again, that's what that cobwebby uh, means. Here's the basal leaves of um, Arctic minus. The leaves in all three species are pretty much the same. So if you just had basal leaves, I don't think you would be able to tell for sure which of the, which of the three it would be. But again, in Iowa, we apparently do not really have either of these two species. Uh, let's take a break right now. We're at a break point. Let's take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, I think I'm going to quick pull up that table and we can take a look at the table of all the Cargia quick and then we'll come back and we'll finish. We just have to key out some some Circium now and uh, a few Centaurias. And that's all we have left. So I'll be back in just a few minutes. All right, I'm back and I pulled up the table here for the card UE. This one has a lot of blue in it because there's a lot of non-native species. And in the Bonat maps, when the species is non-native, they use blue, dark blue to indicate a state where it's present and then light blue to indicate the counties where the species is present as opposed to green, which is used for native species. And again, if you um, haven't been to one of these, these tables are um, just again, lists the species of concern. Here again, I've, I've included the non-native species because there's only six native species. Usually in these tables, uh, it was just the native species that, that we were taking a look at because there's usually plenty of them. So I've got the three Arcteums here. And again, as I said, um, what, what FNA says is that the, the, the person who did the treatment in FNA again said that he has not seen any specimens of uh, Arctium lapa, the great burdock or woolly burdock 
in Iowa. And we see in the maps there, I mean, it's just a couple of, well, three counties, I think, well, actually just two counties and a couple of counties in each one of these for each one of those species. So again, I think it could be a situation. Um, well, it is the, the, the maps that Bonap here are utilizing the data from Eilers and Rosa. Uh, and so Eilers and Rosa say that there are vouchers um, someplace, I guess, because they are listed, both species are in the vascular plants of Iowa. What could be is that they were misidentified or something. Uh, I don't know, again, what the reason is. Uh, that might make sense if they were misidentified. And then the person who did the treatment for Arctium, you know, uh, corrected that. But anyway, uh, Common burdock, of course, is the one that we have, and you can see it's, it is in every county. Then uh, we have a couple of the, the two carduous species. Uh, again, um, what I'm giving you here is just some information. The, the uh, first column here has the correct scientific name according to the floor of North America. And then Eilers and Rosa is in this column, what the name is in Eilers and Rosa, which again is somewhat outdated now from 1994. Habitat, Iowa, uh, biogeography, and then the Bonap map for the United States. So Carduus acanthoides and um, Mustasol. And you can see that um, they're both somewhat more in Western Iowa. And I don't doubt that Mustasol, of course, incurs in more counties than is shown here. This again, we, these maps are always done on the basis of vouchers that have been collected and are in a her, her herbarium and, and prove then that the species is where it was found. Or sometimes they, uh, especially bone app, will use, I think, floristic data lists too. I did put uh, where the non-native species uh, came from. That's another thing that's in the column over here on the, on the far left. So there's 10 centurias. Uh, most of them, as you're gonna see here, are like just, just one old record in Eilers and Rosa. And I don't know again, if it was identified correctly or not, who knows for sure, unless someone goes back and looks at it and checks it. Um, so although there's 10 species in Eilers and Rosa, uh, very few of them seem to be of any you know, major concern. All of these are non-native, and some of these can be very bad uh, non-native invasive species. But I seldom see any of these species, even the ones that uh, are a little bit more common, like bachelor's buttons here. Uh, and I'm curious if any of you, if you want to just, you know, if you want to put it in the um, uh, chat or whatever, if any of you have seen any any of these centurias, which are again, you know, not, uh, nap weeds or star thistles, are the common names. But so we'll look at um, cyanus here. That's one of the four species that I'm going to put into a key because there's a few more counties for it. Um, diffusa again doesn't look like it's really it's really a western species. Oh, and the pink here means that it's a noxious species in that state. Uh, Centuria JCE is again just one lone record. Uh, this is one in which the name has changed. It was Centuria maculosa in Isla Generosa. It's now Centuria estoibi in Florida, North America. It's present enough that I used, I included it in the key. It's one of the four species. These two, only one record. Um, and this one again is in Isla Generosa. Both of these are based on it. And then we have another one that's changed name from Centuria repens to Acropitalon. Uh, that's Russian knapweed. I included it. It's a little bit, there's at least four records, again, just in the Northwest. And then uh, also included this one here, yellow star thistle, a few records. This is all good because again, these can be very bad uh, invasive species. And then there's this, the native ones. Of course, here's all the Circiums. Um, now these will, have, these will have coefficients of conservatism associated with them. 
Um, I forgot to put in here, I see uh, these two are at least special concern species here, uh, hills thistle and swamp thistle. But this again shows you where they are in Iowa pretty well. You can see that in most cases, well, the cerium discolor is pretty much statewide. Floodman I would say is a little bit more, you know, Northwest Iowa. Uh, Helii certainly seems to be more in the Eastern half of Iowa. And Muticum is definitely a North Central and Northeast uh, species growing in uh, wet areas. Undulatum, I see it mostly out in the Western part of the state, but it shows records that kind of come from all across the, the state there. And then uh, both thistle is everywhere. And here's the uh, Scotch thistle, Autoportum. Uh, there's just a couple of records of it. All right, so that's a quick look at uh, the table. Just pull back the PowerPoint here. We're going to take a look now at Circeums. Uh, this is the one that probably is most important, of course, for you. So we have six species to key out here. And the first one that's going to come out here is the bull thistle. We're going to use that characteristic you see there uh, with the internodes on, on the stem having those really spiny wings, uh, as you see again in this picture right here. Uh, the native ones, uh, again, won't really have uh, that extent of spininess on the stem. They can have some, a little bit of a wing that kind of comes down at the, from the leaf base where the leaf is attached to the stem. And then from that point, uh, maybe a short little distance that can be a, a wing that's, that, that's decurrent. That means running down the stem. This, this is less than halfway to the next lower node uh, where it begin in, in both of us. So it's usually all the way down um, covering that, that full length from one node to the next and, and pretty, um, pretty conspicuous. This is just a basal rosette of Circeum bulgari uh, basal leaves. I was gonna point out that you, when you're looking at uh, the two non-native ones that can look a little bit similar at this stage, just in these basal rosettes would be Carduus nutans, the must thistle, and Circeum vulgari, the bull thistle. What I found is that the um, bull thistle always looks a little bit uh, more like medium green, um, maybe a little bit grayish green, Whereas the must thistle, Cardius nutans, its leaves, its basal leaves seem to be more of a shiny green. All right, so we got Circeum vulgari out. We'll see some more pictures of it. I think uh, I think I included. No, I guess I didn't. Uh, these are just these are only two pictures that I have for it. Then we're going to um, separate the rest of the cerciums into these two groups based on the amount of pubescence on the underside of the leaf. This is a characteristic you may have heard about before. It is one that does help to distinguish the native thistles from the non-native ones. The, the non-native ones are gonna look more like this right here. They, they won't have the dense white hairiness that you see right here. But note that not all native thistles look like this. So this is saying that the leaves are green beneath, uh, if loosely tomentose, that means it has a little bit of, of white hairiness. Um, it's not really enough to hide the green color of the leaf, uh, the green or pale green color of the ventral side of the leaf is still clearly seen. Whereas in 2A, which is actually going to be on the next uh, page here, we see leaves densely tomentose beneath the green surface, uh, fully hidden. This leaf up here is another example of it. Uh, it, it those leaves, again, that have that, that dense tomentose hairiness, it's just like a carpet, a thick carpet of short little hairs that, that really do turn the leaf, the bottom side of the leaf looks very white. Uh, you don't see really uh, that greenness. So again, that's, those two characteristics right here. So the ones that um, have just very little, if any hair, and look more like this, that's gonna be these three species right here. Hills thistle is this one right here. Uh, this, was, this is the new name for it. 
Cerium humilum. And uh, of course, this is Canada thistle, and this is swamp thistle. So these three here are going to look something like this. Now, this one here, Cerium arvensi, uh, it says in part because you can find sometimes Canada thistle weeds that look a little bit more like this. You, you could possibly go that direction because sometimes, especially in younger leaves, uh, they can have a little bit more hair. So Canada thistle is gonna key out two places. It's gonna key out right here. And it's also gonna key out with these leaves that look like this. But we can pull off Hills thistle right here on the uh, with 3A and 3B here. Uh, on the size, the broadness of the involucre, uh, which is said shown right here, 3.5 to 6 centimeters. By the way, a, a number in parentheses like this simply means this is the range that they typically are. Sometimes, sort of, you know, on the extreme upper side, they could be as much as 7 centimeters broad is what that means. Uh, the spines on the outer fillaries is another good one right here. It says mostly 1.5 to 3.5 millimeters long versus um, shorter here, 1 to 1 1.5. So we're just looking at those spines on, the, on those involucral bracts again. And um, oh, the number of heads uh, is another one that's in here as, as well. We'll look at um, some examples of, of uh, those envelopers in just a little bit. So if, uh, if we pull off Hill's thistle here, um, because we have characteristics that go with this, then we've got two left here. And so if we went with 3B, then we're gonna look at uh, 4A and 4B here and separate them. And they're separated easily on the fillaries here. Um, here's the fillaries of Circea marvensi right here. You see the, there's little spines on the fillaries here on those involucral bracts. Um, short ones, 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter long. You can kind of see them here, but they're, they're there. Uh, whereas spines on those fillaries, none or less than 0 0.5 is what we see right here. So this is, uh, this one is Circea marvensi, and this one here is uh, swamp thistle, just using the spines on the on the bracts. Um, there can be some cobwebbiness here. It says uh, mainly just on the edges of the fillaries. You can see some short little cilia hairs here. Cilia is a term we use for just really short little hairs. I can see a little bit here, and that's what they're kind of referring to here, just on the margins. Whereas in in swamp thistle. The involucre is more or less, that's what plus minus means, more or less sort of cobwebby pubescent. Again, you can kind of see that all throughout in here, there's that cobwebby uh, kind of hairiness uh, that we're seeing again here. There's a difference a little bit in the size of the, uh, the spines on the leaves, as it says here. Um, spines on leaves, 3.5 to 7 versus uh, less than that. So again, I don't have a picture of that, but the, those are the spines again that are on the, on the margins of the leaves. This one, uh, you know, you know where, uh, probably know where Canada thistle grows. It, it does tend to be, um, I would say kind of in general, mesic grasslands, the wet mesic grasslands, um, but swamp thistle really grows in really pretty wet places uh, that would be too wet for Canada thistle. Okay, um, let's take a look at some examples here. The next one then shows those three species. <clears throat> Oops, shows those three species that we just keyed out. Just some some nice pictures here. Um, there are names again all at the top right there. Um, Hills thistle on the far left, swamp thistle in the middle, and Canada thistle on the far right. One thing I noticed here is that the involucre bracts on on a hills thistle, you can see it looks like there's sort of a, you know, just pull up a bigger picture here. It looks like there's sort of a real pale green uh, median uh, stripe or so, at least on the lower ones. 
Um, this is probably the, this picture, of course, here is that head right there. Um, these down here show a little bit of that same thing as well. The lower ones show a little bit of a light green color there. This shows the stem and hill thistle is pretty hairy. Um, there's some typical leaf for it right there. It's a short plant, kind of a bushy plant. I could kind of see right here. I, when I think of it, with lots of leaves, uh, usually doesn't grow very tall. Kind of has a larger uh, a, a flower head that's kind of larger than what it looks like it should have for the size of the plant. Here's swamp thistle. Again, uh, it has some sparse pubescence on the stem. Its leaves seem to be pretty large and, you know, again, very deeply uh, lobed in through here. There's a basil rosette for it. I've only seen it a few times up in Northeast Iowa. There's a couple of flower heads for it. And then there's uh, canna thistle, of course. Stem, leaf. Small, much smaller flower heads. There's what it looks like when it's, of course, dispersing those fruits. Okay, now we will finish off the cerium here by again looking at those the, the leaves now that are densely tomentose beneath, uh, those that have so much pubescence on the undersurface of the leaf that the, the leaf actually looks white. And so there's four species here, and they kind of separate nicely. Uh, the first two, Phlegmanii and Undulatum, uh, have stems. The upper inner nodes of their stems are also very densely hairy, uh, What you're seeing right here. This is what we would call um, an example of 6A, or excuse me, 5A, 5A right here. And then 5B, upper inner nodes not tomentose are only very lightly so is this one over here. You can, there's a few little hairs on there, but they're not nearly as dense and thick, you know, as they are here. Again, forming sort of this whitish, here's kind of a grayish white uh, because of the, the greenness there. But if the leaves, bottom side of the leaves and the stems are both very densely hairy, but they look white, then you've got either of these two species, Phlegmanii or Angelatum. Now it gets a little bit harder to separate Phlegmanii and Undulatum. Uh, there's three things here. Um, I could really only really find, well, there's two of them here that I'm gonna show you. Uh, what I'm showing you right here is the, uh, this characteristic that you see right here, the involucre, how long the involucre is. So in Phlegmanii, it's two to 2.7 centimeters. So if you were to measure from the base of the involucre to the top of the involucre, we're looking at that. Whereas in undulatum, it's three to 3.5. This one does say that it can be as small as 2.7, which kind of matches there. But for the most part, again, this is a rare thing for it to be 2.7. So there is, um, there's 0.3 centimeters pretty much here that separates them. So that's, that's pretty good uh, when you're dealing with something like this. Uh, I couldn't find pictures of the Achenes, but if you have the Achenes, that's probably even a better way. You just pull some Achenes off and measure them. 3.4 over here to 5.7 over here. Uh, that would be pretty easy. Uh, when you don't have any of the flowers though, then all you've got are the leaves on the stem. You really need to have a stem uh, to do this. You can't really, most thistles are pretty hard to do as basal rosettes. You, you really have to have a stem uh, to be sure. Then you could use this first one, the lateral lobes, how broad the base of the lateral lobes on the leaves are. I'm, I'm gonna show you a picture of that in just a little bit. Anyway, that's gonna give us those two species. If, if again, the upper inner nodes are densely white tomentose. Uh, if they're not, then we're down here, upper inner nodes not tomentose. That of course is gonna to lead to autism and discolor, two of the most common thistles, of course, in the state. And it's also gonna to lead to arvensia again. If Arvensia did have hairs that were on the bottom side of the leaf that were dense enough to make you uh, go this direction, then we, we're gonna pull it off real quick right now, because again, we can use that same sort of characteristic we had before, the involucre um, has really short little spines. Uh, 
Well, excuse me. Yeah, this, here it is. The fillers of spines none are up to about one millimeter long. I don't have a picture of it here. The picture was on the previous one. So again, back, back here, these right here. That's the size we're looking at right here. Fillories with spines none are up to one millimeter long. Uh, again, what these two down here are going to have, are they going to have spines that are 3.5 to 6.5, more like this right here. These are the spines on the involucral bracts of um, one of these two species. I think is, I think this was discolor. So again, pretty easy to separate them off and just Gestalt wise, again, Canathosa looks a lot different than either of these two species. So, uh, but that's something you have to kind of learn as you go. Then we need to separate altissimum and discolor here. And the most uh, typical thing we use is, is the leaves, which you see right here, the, the middle calling, upper, upper calling. Calling means the stem leaves. So the middle and upper stem leaves are unlobed to just shallowly lobed. These are not lobed at all right here versus the same leaves, middle and upper stem leaves, deeply pinnately lobed that you see over here. Here we see there's lobes cut into those leaves. The lobes go almost down to the mid vein, but not, you know, not quite. There's still tissue right along that mid vein there. Now, uh, it is important to realize that the um, leaves on altissimum can be um, a little bit more lobed. They can look a little bit like that. They're just not as deeply lobed as these over, over here. Uh, I would say most of the time you will find some of the leaves are more like this. And maybe some of the bottom leaves are a little bit more like, like that. Uh, another approach to this is looking at the fillaries here. So it says the tips on some of the fillaries expanded. Um, I don't usually use this. You have to have flower heads, of course, to do this. But if you had flower heads, you could look at those bracts, again, the involucral bracts. It says here, altissimum has the tips on those are, are scarious, which means it's kind of like really thin, like papery tissue. Uh, expanded at the base of the fillery tip and then contracted before tapering to the actual tip of the, of, of the bract where this one says the, the, the scariest tips of the innermost fillaries all narrowly tapered to the uh, tip, not expanded at the base. So it's, it's whether, whether those, those tips are expanded at the base or whether they're not expanded at the base. Uh, I think, I think you, know, you can do a pretty good job separating the two just by using the leaves. So I, I don't usually use, use that. So here are uh, some pictures again of those two. And here's, here's the character I was talking about. So this is undulatum over here on the right. And what we're looking at in terms of the, again, we're looking at the width of the base of the lobes. So I've, you can see a lot of lobes here. They're short little lobes on the leaves. Each of the lobes has a spine on it, as most uh, cerciums and other thistles do. And this white arrow is showing the, where you would measure across uh, at the base of that lobe. There's two of them here. Here's another one right here that's even, even more uh, broad than what this one is right here. But again, over seven millimeters. If the base of these lobes is more than seven millimeters, then uh, you've got undulatum. If it's less than seven millimeters, then it's phlegmanii. Okay, um, and just the picture, some pictures again um, of them in uh, sort of their full glory here basal rosettes for both of them. Again, you can't really do much with those basal rosettes. Um, you just have, it has to be written down as Circium spa for the most part. I mean, if I, if I know I'm in a place where it's either Circium discolor or Circium altissimum, then I'll, I'll, I'll put that. But uh, if you're out in the Los Hills, for example, or in Western Iowa, you could have um, Flodmanii or un un Undulatum too. All right, the last slide. Uh, as I said, we're gonna take a look at four of those uh, centurias. Uh, the four that are the most common, uh, these four right here, they're actually pretty easy. Uh, at least these four are. Uh, I don't know about the other six, of course. The other six um, uh, are so 
uncommon in the state is give me a murder there's only like one or two records uh, at the best for those uh, other six species again i don't see these hardly ever which is good i uh, wonder if any of you have ever seen uh, very much of these but you can pretty much figure them all out just by looking at their involucral bracts and that's what the first uh, couplets looking at the involucral bract margins are entire and somewhat papery um, that's what we're looking at right here versus the involucral bracts uh, their margins are sort of spiny or they could be fringed Fringe is what we're looking at right here. Fringe is what we're looking at right here. These two have the margins of these bracts have little, little cilia that are forming that fringe that is, is being described here or irregular. Now you could also look at the fruits as it says there. And remember in the, in the centuri, they had those fruits, the cipsellas that had an asymmetrical base. If you go back to the picture that we used to separate centurias from circiums, cer uh, and they had most of them had that kind of like a, a little um, pit or a little uh, invagination on the on the base of the cipsella where it was attached. Well, that's what's being described here for C. repens, uh, which is Russian knapweed. It doesn't really. It looks more like a circium basically, is what this is saying. The cipselli are nearly symmetrical at the base and that attachment scar, that's, that's the term I was, was looking for. Those attachment scars are only slightly oblique off to the side. Uh, so it's not as strongly oblique as most of the centurias. And that's what this is saying. Now, cipselli are noticeably asymmetrical and noticeably that attachment scar is off to the side. It's, more strongly oblique in the way it was, it was attached. So that pulls off again, uh, Russian knapweed right here. Uh, the rest of them all come underneath 1B here. Now, the next one that's gonna come off here is uh, Centauria solstitialis. I guess is how that might be pronounced. Uh, and we're going to look at the involucral bracts, and it has a very strong and conspicuous and sharp spiny tip, the terminal spine, very long and stout, much longer and stouter than any other of the spines that might be on the sides of those bracts. That's what we got right here. Look at those spines. Those are, those look pretty wicked. That is yellow star thistle. Most of these centurions, by the way, are really problems out west. They're really invasive species further west. They don't, they, apparently they, they have, have come into Iowa, but they're not um, doing real well here, which is good. Okay, so that's, that pulls off um, you know, yellow star thistle. Uh, if the involucral bracts are, don't look like that, they, have, they don't have that really strong spiny tip, at most it's a short tip. Or again, more commonly, the tips of the bracts are fringed, like this again. Um, then we're going to go on to 3A and 3B, and we'll have uh, either this one or this one, because these both have the same looking bracts, short little bracts that don't have any spines. They just have little fringes on the, on the ends, on the sides of them. Uh, so EB and cyanus, and the way those would be separated is just on their leaves, uh, real simple. Uh, Principal leaves here are, are compound or at least deeply lobed. That's what this one is right here. Or the principal leaves is simple, like this leaf right here. Sometimes they can have a few little teeth, so a little few serrations or little lobes towards their base, but they're basically, again, a, um, a simple leaf and clearly not anything that looks like that. You can also use color a little bit. Um, uh, Stoli B, again, is the... Um, um, Cornflower, uh, which is pinkish to whitish, usually uh, a lavender color, and cyanus, uh, again, which is bachelor buttons. Excuse me. Um, this one again is, uh, Stoy B is, uh, what is the common name for it? Oh, it is spotted knapweed. There we go, spotted knapweed. This is bachelor's button up here bachelor's button or cornflower. It's usually blue, but it can have, it can be lavender though. So you would think maybe you just use a color of the corollas to separate them, but 
this one can be, it can have lavender color sometimes. It's, it's uh, mostly it's going to be blue. So that might be good. I mean, if you certainly have one that's blue, uh, then that's probably what you got. Oh, I was going to point out here too is yellow star thistle has a very conspicuous wing on the stems. As you see right here, it's, it's also be very unique, uh, easy to identify without the, without the flowers uh, because of those wing stems. So that does it. That's all of the uh, cards you eat. Are there any questions? Yeah, that trivia, uh, Mr. Floodman or Dr. Floodman is buried uh, in uh, the cemetery out by uh, Wahoo, Nebraska. I did find his grave, but I've never oh, really? seen Floodman's thistle yet. But, Wahoo, Nebraska, huh? Yeah, Wahoo, yeah. That's what, west of Sioux City a ways? No, no, it's just west, it's, uh, west of Omaha. Oh, it's west of Omaha, okay. Yeah, but he's a Nebraskan. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, where is the receptacle located in relation with the envelope? Um, usually on most flowers, the, the, uh, the, the envelope bracts sit below the receptacle. Um, and that would be, yeah, that's what's happening here too. I'm just looking at some pictures over here. The all those disc flowers you see, of course, up at that sit way above the involucral bracts, they're attached to a receptacle. So what's kind of happening is there's um, receptacle tissue probably uh, again where the of course there is receptacle tissue there where the where those disc flowers are attached. That's what they're attached to. Uh, but then there's some kind of like a cylindrical. Uh, part to that receptacle apparently coming down because uh, the the bracts have to be attached to something too but the uh the the receptacle that we are concerned with when we're looking for those whether it's got scales or whether it's got um, bristles on it uh, that's up there right at the top of the envelope or where where those disc florets are okay um our Blood manii and undulatum biennial. Well, I don't know for sure, but we can find out real pretty pretty quick. Uh, I have um, floor of North America up here <clears throat> on my other computer. <laughs> so, Well, Flamanii is perennial and undulatum, let's see here. It is perennial too. But I think uh, this color is a biennial, let's see. Yeah, this color is a biennial or sometimes perennial. So again, there's there's going to always be some, there could always be some variation there, whether it's a biennial or a perennial. So, you know, the biennial only lives for two years. So it's going to flower that second year and die. When it says biennial or sometimes perennial, what that usually means is, well, maybe it, it doesn't quite do it in two years. It, it's still growing in the third year, then it, flowers and dies. Since it went into a third year, by definition, it's a perennial. Three or more years um, is, is a perennial. And then uh, the other one, altissimum, I think that's a biennial too, or a short-lived monocarpic perennial. Monocarpic meaning that it just, you know, it flowers once and it dies after it flowers. So that's, a, that's just something that separates those two groups, I guess, the, the undulatum and flood are perennials, and the other two are biennials most of the time. Okay, that's all we got okay. in the chat, unless anybody has any questions they wanna, if they wanna unmute. Okay, well, has anyone seen any of those uh, napweeds or star thistles? We've got napweed at Chachaqua. Do you? It, came in on nursery tree root stock. Is it spotted, that napweed? Yep. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that we um, 
we're actually spraying out the whole prairie. It's How are you? um a uh, it's like it's only about six acres. So um we're burning it again to that way we don't have to um you know have better contact with the vegetation, but we're gonna go in and spray it all again. Um second year in a row and we're just gonna keep nuking it <laughs> yeah have you did you try to ex try to kill it some other way first or yeah we we tried spot spraying it the problem is the plant is so hard to find the vegetation is so minimal that it's right. and the heads are so tiny those flowering heads are so small it's a huge challenge to find that plant in a mature prairie <laughs> Um, and it's it's a reconstruction, and you know, to to settle everyone's nerves, the reconstruction was um, not seeded by Polk County, and so it actually had a whole bunch of really gnarly had stuff. A bunch in of it. bad stuff yeah. in it. So you, yeah, yeah, it had well. a bunch of bad stuff in it anyway. So nobody's really nobody's heart is hurt. No one's going to cry over that, huh? Yeah. Right. Nope. Sounds like that's a good example to start over. Yeah, it had like lupins and like some. Uh, lupins. Yeah, it had a it had a bunch of weird stuff in it, so it no no nobody's nobody's hurt over this. Yeah, start over and do it right. Yeah, other than our terror and you know concern about that nap weed getting out of control. Yeah. Yeah, that would be the concern if it moved to other areas. Well, hopefully that hasn't happened. It's moved out from its original spot, but it it hasn't gone very far. So. Well, I think that's all we got. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, yeah. We have one more in the series next week. Based of species, right? Yep. All right. Well, um, thanks for again joining this evening, and uh, hope you have a good week. Hope it uh, starts turning spring pretty soon. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. All right. Good night. See ya. See ya.